Hello, and welcome to This Is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Steed, where we explore everything you need to know about your brain for a long and healthy life. I'm happy to have my patient, the New York Times Baghdad Bureau Chief and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Alyssa Rubin, as our special guest. In 2014, Alyssa was seriously injured and nearly killed in a helicopter crash in the Middle East. Her skull was fractured in addition to many serious injuries. So often with traumatic brain injury, we hear about the events but have no idea about what the patient goes through. Today, Alyssa will share her story, a long and miraculous recovery. Welcome, Alyssa. So just to set the pace and tone, can you go back to that time in 2014 and tell us why you were boarding this helicopter in Kurdistan and and then what happened? I was going on the helicopter because, as you may remember, there were between 20 and 50,000 Yazidis who had fled from an area that the Islamic State had invaded in northern Iraq. They had gone first to Mosul, which is the place everyone's heard of, and then they branched out into other areas. We knew that the Kurdistan and Iraqi sort of military were taking with them food, water, sort of very, very basic supplies to leave for the refugees who, who were running out of water. It was as, So these people were living there to escape from. They, they had living there by choice. Well, oh, no, they were certainly not living there by choice. They had fled there and they had fled with really nothing, pretty okay. much. Some of them were barefoot. It was an extraordinarily harsh environment, particularly in summer in Iraq is scorchingly hot, it's dry, it's a lethal environment, particularly for vulnerable people. So um, you were going there then to, to just to see? To see what it was so that we could tell people, as a journalist, you want to see it yourself. And so I was very excited and fought very hard to get a place on the helicopter going up, and really very unworried. I've been on a lot of helicopters, and m- mostly U.S. military, but others as well. I don't ever worry about it. (laughs) Looking back now, having read what you described, is that a helicopter you'd actually want to get on? It sounded to me like it was overloaded, overtaxed. Well, it wasn't overloaded going up. And after all, that was where you made the decision was based on, you know, what was the number of people on it and what was in it. And what was in it was, you know, lots and lots of water, bananas, bread. I remember very clearly worrying that I was crushing the bread and then the bread wouldn't be very good to eat because there were were no seats on this helicopter. This is a metal tube (laughs) in the sky held up by a propeller. I had talked to the helicopter pilot before I got on and I knew he was a very experienced person. So that gave me quite a bit of confidence. And there was a member of the Iraqi parliament coming up, the only Yazidi member. And I thought, well, if they're gonna put a member of parliament on it, you know, what's there to worry about? And so we got up there, and there were very, very ill people. Elderly, children, people could barely walk. And the pilot, I think, really had a heart of gold. And he wanted to help as many as possible. And the people just rushed onto it as soon as all the food and water was unloaded. And way too many people got on. And that was the problem. And that was overloaded. And it crashed. Right, it crashed. It it went up about seven meters, eight meters maybe. We don't know exactly. And then it, it fell. So what's your recollection of that? Do you have any recollection of that immediate event? The immediate moment of contact, I don't remember. I remember that it began to tip. The pilot righted it a little, and then it began to tip again. And I was waiting for the crash, and I never experienced in my memory, the crash. I've regained a lot of my memory of the event, but not that. So what's the first thing you remember? I remember coming to and thinking, I'm alive. And I also thought, I have to get out of here. But I didn't really know how to do that. And finally, I thought, I think if I just hoist myself up using my arms, I can do it. And then my arms couldn't do anything because both my wrists were crushed. And I looked down and I didn't know why they weren't working. 
Unfortunately, there were some people there to at least help you in a first aid fashion. The photos I saw looked like you must have had a large cut on your forehead. I had a lot of cuts. I had, I think when you saw me, they'd put about 15 stitches in my face. But there was no one on the mountain with a first aid background. Very luckily, there were some some gorillas who were there who were fighting with the Yazidis. One of the men took off his scarf and he tied my wrists so they were sort of immobilized. And I, I could never thank him enough for doing that because the pain was excruciating. So fast forward then, I presume an emergency helicopter came, picked you up, and they took you directly from there to where? Back to the Iraqi army base from which I had left, where I was put into, I think it was sort of like a minivan on the floor. I mean, all of this was very primitive, and we bumped over... Uh, it was a horrible trip. And you trip. remember this? This, this I remember. remember. It was awful. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember I came in and out. and excruciating I Excruciating pain? Excruciating pain everywhere, wanting to sleep and being afraid to sleep because I was afraid that something bad would happen in my brain and maybe I wouldn't wake up. And then they took me to a trauma hospital and they were worried about bleeding in my brain and they did an MRI and they decided I could travel somewhere and then they put me in a taxi, I guess, and the taxi was driven to the border, and then I was transferred into another taxi for the other side of the border, right? I mean, it was awful. I came to kind of came in and out of consciousness. I don't remember all so of it. So sophisticated enough that they had, a, had an MRI scan, which is great, but then taxi transport. Then the very kindly, the Turkish government, they were medevacking the Yazidi member of parliament to Istanbul, and they, they medevacked me as well. And your healthcare experience in Istanbul was positive? Yes, it was very, very positive. I was in the American hospital. People spoke English. But I have to say, I had only one thought I was able to hold on to at a time. And that thought was that I, I, wanted, I wanted to have written an article out of this experience. I went there for a reason. And I felt horrible and guilty that, and terrible that somehow this had happened. And I, I had to do something before I completely fell apart, because I, I couldn't really think in any coherent way, to be honest. I guess I want to dissect this a little bit. You were having terrible symptoms, but you still had this bond, emotion, emotional sense that you wanted to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. What were the what were the symptoms you were experiencing through this? You said you were fading in, fading out, afraid of going to sleep, afraid you weren't going to wake up. That and Must have been and excruciating pain, pain. Enormous pain because they hadn't treated anything. And they were afraid of giving me morphine because of the sedative brain effects sedative of. effects and the potential damage I think that could cause. Um, I had a punctured lung, and I, I couldn't have walked if I wanted to. I mean, my everything kind of collapsed. What would you say about your thought processes? Did you feel like you were oriented and you could no, interact? No, I didn't. I, I just felt like I was holding on, and I didn't have a good sense of time. I remember that. I remember I'd opened my eyes and... One of my colleagues came with me, and he was there, and then I'd open my eyes again a little later, and he wouldn't be there. And I, I wouldn't know if it had been a little time, a long time. No. It was a blank. And then we fast forward a little bit, and we get this phone call that there is a, an American journalist over in Istanbul, and they ask if we would be willing to accept you in transfer, because in doctor speak, you had a, a moderate traumatic brain injury. That's obviously more serious than a, a mild traumatic brain injury, which is more commonly known as a concussion. But the worst problem was all the other injuries that you had, the, the wrist fracture, the punctured lung, you did have multiple facial fractures and all these lacerations. And then my nose was quite broken and the septum was sort of askew. Yeah. And then the thing that was really not addressed at all, certainly in the acute phase, was the lingering effect that this had on your brain in terms of how you were functioning. And that's where I, I'm totally surprised. I, was it was it in the Istanbul hospital bed that you still wrote an article? I didn't write it. I dictated it to my colleague, Rod Nordland. So you could dictate it? It was the only way I could do it because I couldn't use my hands at all. I mean, they were completely bound up. They were broken. They were in 
sh- shooting pain. And so I knew I wanted to do this because I didn't know how long I'd be able to do it for. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I also really felt strongly that the pilot was not incompetent. He was a person of great heart, and he had died doing this. And I felt like, why should I have lived when he was, he actually saved a lot of people. Those people almost all lived. That's a, yeah, that's a, a couple of story. other people di- didn't. They were, I, I've gone back now and tried to trace everybody. So I think a total of probably three or four died, but the others survived. Obviously, you knew that you had injuries and you ached. And, you know, when we all get sick, we realize we're not at our, on our A game. But when did you realize that it wasn't only that you weren't on your A game, but there was actually some changes that had occurred as a result of this crash? It was after I got home. I was lying on the bed I grew up on, basically, and I took down a, a book of, I still remember, it was Chekhov short stories. And I thought, oh, I'll... I'll just read these. I can't really remember them now anyway. I, you know, I read them in high school. I was reading and my mother, I put down the book. My mother came in and she said, oh, what are you reading? And I didn't know what I had been reading. I I had no memory of what I had been reading. It, It was like there was an eraser in my brain coming behind each word and wiping it away. And I was terrified because that's all I do. I read, I think about what I've read, I come up with questions and I go out and talk to people and then I write it. And if I can't read and retain anything, what use am I? And there was one other thing that happened. I went to get my first hand therapy for to recover and I got to the counter where they check you in and the woman said, uh, who are you here to see? And I said, I I don't know. And then she said, well, why are you here? And I thought, I I don't know. Why am I here? (laughs) And I was, I burst into tears. You've won innumerable awards for journalism. You're an incredibly accomplished individual. So I can just imagine what was going on in your mind, or what wasn't going on right. in your I mind. Right, I mean, I just felt, felt who, like I was a child, you know, and didn't really know where to go to sign up for a class or something. Yep. And, and so I remember I came into you, and I was very, I felt very strongly that I had to go back to work. And you said, well, I can write you a note, but you will fail. Uh, if you go back this soon, you're not ready. And I was really upset. And I think I began to cry there, too. And that was actually very useful. We both recognized that there was something more going on in for me. I mean, there was not just the actual injury, but the emotional reaction to the injury and, and how that pulls you down because you're not yourself anymore. What people need to understand is that as a result of your injury, you didn't have a specific blood clot or some focal injury to your brain, but what had happened was the connection fibers between the various regions of your brain had been disrupted, and like any other organ, it takes time for those things to improve. And at the time of that office meeting, I had two goals. Number one was to get you to realize that you weren't there yet, because I knew from your hospital bed you had told your editor or your your boss that I'm going back to Baghdad, which I was totally in favor of, but not just then. So I was hoping to give you the realization of your problem but then also the permission to cut yourself some slack because that's not something you do for yourself normally. Can you characterize that, you know, after we had that conversation, some of the emotional repercussions or the feelings that you were having? I guess I was glad that you were blunt, but angry that you were blunt because I really felt like I didn't have a lot of time. I thought if I'm away too long, somebody else will take my place. It doesn't matter. We are all fungible. And I, I, you really know that as a journalist. That's why the system works. I felt terribly precarious emotionally yeah. and also in terms of what my future would be. I have to say you, you were helped a lot in the advice you gave because I happen to have a very 
close friend who also came to see me at the same time, who's also a doctor, who also said, you, you're depressed and you need to do something about this. It was clear to me and many people around you that you were suffering from depression and probably from post-traumatic stress disorder. I really look forward to talking with you about this in more detail. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of This Is Your Brain with Dr. Phil Stieg. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit us at drphilsteeg.com to submit your comments and suggestions. Remember, a healthy brain is your number one priority.